wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Boss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here from the com. The Chris Voss Show. Hey, welcome to the show, guys. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. We've got an amazing show coming up that I think your guys' minds are going to be blown. We have David Rubenstein, uh, who is a New York Times bestseller. He is uh, basically giving a master class in his newest book that just came out September 13th, 2022. He's the legendary co-founder of the Carlisle Group. Uh, his book is called How to Invest Masters on the Craft. We're going to be talking to him about his book and uh, his amazing insights that he has put into it. Uh, also, in the meantime, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Tell them to go to youtube.com for Chess Chris Voss. Ask people, have you sat down and subscribed to the Chris Voss Show? The family that loves you but doesn't judge you. The best kind of family there is. Go to goodreads.com for Chess Chris Voss, our big 130,000 LinkedIn group, and the LinkedIn newsletter. Subscribe to all the wonderful stuff that's going on over there as well. Without further ado, he is the author, as I mentioned before, uh, How to Invest, Masters in the Craft. Just came out September 13th, 2022. It's hot off the presses. Still has that uh, wonderful pressed ink smell. For those of you who are probably uh, buying it in hard copy, for those of you who are buying on Audible, you may trust trouble smelling that. But he is the New York Times bestselling author of How to Lead, The American Experiment, and The American Story. He is the co-author and co-chairman of the Carlisle Group, one of the world's largest and most successful private equity firms. Uh, Mr. Rubenstein is a chairman of the boards of John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts on the Council on Foreign Relations. We've had a number of uh, uh, Council of Foreign Relations people on the show. And the National Gallery of Art. He's the original signer of the Giving Pledge and a recipient of the Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy and MoMA's David Rockefeller Award. The host of Bloomberg Wealth, with David Rubenstein on Bloomberg TV and the David Rubenstein Show, peer-to-peer -peer conversations on Bloomberg TV and PBS. He lives in the Washington, D.C. area, and now he's on the Chris Voss Show. Welcome to the show, David. How are you? Well, my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to have you as well. Uh, any dot-coms or places on the Internet you want people to uh, come see you or find out more about you? No, um, anybody intelligent will be watching this uh, podcast or listening to this. So that's all I need, right? Well, let's not push it on this show. I don't know. We have an incredibly brilliant, intelligent audience. Thank you very much. Uh, and those not watching on YouTube, I encourage you to go check uh, out uh, David's office on YouTube. He has a plethora of uh, collectibles behind him that is just extraordinary to look at. But David, what motivated you want to write this book, sir? Well, I've been in the investment world for about 35 years, and I've observed a lot of mistakes that people have made. But mm -hmm. I also thought that I could get access to the best investors in the United States, interview them, and let them describe how they became so great. And the idea was not to make, enable somebody to read a book and become a great investor, but to give them some tips on how they can, as an average person, invest better than they're already doing. That's the idea behind it. There you go. It's it's a build as a master class on investing. And I imagine you guys uh, have some success in your background of investing that uh, will give you those insights. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. Um, in my own firm, we've now we started I started the firm in 1987 with five million dollars. And now we manage about three hundred and seventy billion dollars. Wow. The firm has done pretty well over the years. One of the larger uh, global private equity firms. And I you know, have learned some things about investing over the years. So I wouldn't claim to be a great investor myself, but I interview the people who are the best venture capital investors or distressed debt investors or hedge fund investors in the, in the, in the United States. And, and they have some pretty good lessons. There you go. So is it a good time to invest in Bitcoin or what? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just... <laughs> well, I'm not sure. In Bitcoin, I interviewed somebody who's a leading investor in Bitcoin and mm -hmm. that's uh, Mike Novogratz. But I would say, with respect to Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency, you have to be very cautious. They could go down in value dramatically. Mm. But if you can invest 
money that you you can lose your you can afford to lose a certain percentage of your net worth and you enjoy the game of crypto then you can do it but you should realize it's very very risky and you really need to know what you're doing most definitely I, it, i've got a lot of friends that were crypto bros in the tech uh, field and uh i don't know i think they're just swimming in their swimming in their backyards right now in Puerto Rico or something. Uh, so you uh, talk to, uh, uh, in your book, you describe a lot of different examples of stories of people like uh, Mike Novogratz uh, that made $250 million off of crypto in one year. Uh, talk to us about some of the different examples and stories uh, that you have in your book that you featured. Well, I have my own stories of bad investments I made or avoided, I, or I wish I hadn't avoided. I had a chance to invest in Facebook when Mark Zuckerberg was in college, and I turned Ooh. it down. I had a chance to invest in Netscape when it was getting off the ground, and I turned it down. And when Jeff Bezos was starting his company, Amazon, I told him he didn't think it would get very far, and Barnes <laughs> Noble would wipe him out. So um, I made my mistakes. But everybody mm -hmm. in the investment world has made mistakes. Warren Buffett's made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. Mm -hmm. And the trick is to learn from your mistakes. Anybody that tells you they haven't invested and lost money is obviously lying. Every investor of any consequence has lost money on something or another. So mm -hmm. you have to be in the game. And you have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Is your book good for people from all walks of investment life? From, you know, the guy who just has a little family, wants to throw a couple yeah, bucks is, in the stock market too? The book is designed for average people who are not professional investors. Um, and so if you're not a professional investor, the book is designed to give you some ideas of what you should mm -hmm. avoid or what you can do. But you're going to be watching or listening to the, the lessons from the greatest people uh, in the investment world and see what they did. But all of the investment people have started out modestly. They're pretty smart. They go against conventional wisdom and they admit their mistakes. They have a fair amount of humility because they admitted mistakes they've made. Mm -hmm. And then you cover a fair amount of different variety of investments. You uh, uh, you talk with Sam Zell uh, about real estate investing. And so you, you cover more stuff than just stock market stuff. Yes, I covered uh, what I call traditional investments, which would be or mainstream which is stocks and bonds and real estate. And Sam Zell is one of the great real estate investors of the uh, last 100 years or so. But I also covered what I would call alternative investments, which is hedge funds, uh, private equity firms, uh, venture capital, and then what I call cutting edge, which would be things like uh, cryptocurrencies or infrastructure or ESG or uh, SPACs. So the different varieties I try to cover and get the best person I could in each category. There you go. What are, what are some stories that stand out in your book that you would share? Well, John Paulson, for example, uh, thought that mortgages were going down in value, so particularly subprime mortgages around 2006, 7, and 8. And so he, in effect, shorted the subprime mortgage market, and he made $20 billion, wow. the most successful trade anybody's ever done in one kind of trade like that. So, uh, you know, that's an interesting story. Um, another person, Stan Druckenmiller, bet that the British pound was going to fall in 1992, and he made what was then a staggering sum, a billion-dollar profit on a one bet. Um, I'd say I, another interesting one is uh, Mike Moritz, who runs Sequoia or ran Sequoia, the, the biggest, and most successful venture firm. And he went in early into things like uh, Google. And, and, and now he's an early investor in Stripe, which may be one of the most, which is no doubt the most highly valued privately owned company now in the United States is Stripe. Really? And payment wow. processing company. And it's probably when it goes public, people think it could be worth $200 billion dollars started by two guys from two brothers from Ireland who really have built an incredible company. And um, it's, it's, you know, the most highly anticipated new IPO that'll be coming down in the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, the pound has been crashing again. You highlight a story that you mentioned of, uh, earlier. Uh, it, maybe there's some money to make in shorting that, or what do you see uh, in the currency? Shorting market? what? In shorting what? Uh, the British pound? British pound. Well, I think that was a good bet a couple months ago, maybe a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, maybe even a couple of days ago. It's down now so much so that it's hard to see it could go much lower. Now, there is talk about the British pound going to parity with the dollar, mm -hmm. and that would be a gigantic drop from where it had been. I think that that investment game has largely been played, and I don't think there's a lot of money to be made now in shorting the pound much more. It may go down further against the dollar, but the largest drop has probably already occurred. There you go. There you go. Uh, so what's your advice through uh, for people that say are an average investor out there? Uh, what, what do you think is maybe one of the better uh, vehicles that are out there to invest in? I, I, 
it looks like we're seeing a drop in mortgages that will continue for a while. There might be a rebound somewhere in the future. Well, look, the most common mistake that investors make is they get in the market at the wrong time and they get out at the wrong time. <laughs> when the markets are going up, they often rush in. And when the markets mm -hmm. are going down, they rush out, which is the, actually the opposite of what you should do. But for the average person who is not really interested in learning how to be a, a professional investor himself or herself, the best thing to do is to get a good fund manager. It can be in mm. cash, it can be in uh, fixed income, it could be in stocks, it could be in bonds, it could be in venture capital, and let that manager manage your money, making sure you know what you're, they're doing, that you know what the fees are, and basically um, you know, be educated about what their fund manager has done. Trying to outguess the markets or beat the markets as an average investor working part-time doing it is a fool's errand. Mm. Yeah, I mean, is buy low, sell high always seems to be the, the one thing uh, you know, I studied to be a stockbroker back in the day in the 80s. I mean, I remember when the P&E rule was if it hit 15, you were like, oh, that's maxed out. Uh, of course, that's definitely changed in the world of tech stocks and the current well, stock market. After something has happened, it's always easy to say, I should have done that. And exactly. I do that all the time. But the <laughs> trick in investing is figuring out where the future is going to be. Mm. All of life is about picking, predicting the future. But in the investment world, you particularly can measure how well or poorly you've predicted the future. And it really, that's what great investors do. They anticipate where a company is going to go, where an economy is going to go, and they get there before uh, the economy or the company gets there. Mm -hmm. That's definitely uh, something people should think about in trying to, you know, because a lot of people chase the market when it reaches its most highest peak of, of excitement or exuberance. And usually by then it's starting to hit its peaks and everything else. You know, I had friends that were still trying to buy real estate when I could see the Fed was going to move. And I was like, you really don't want to be investing in real estate right now because the Fed is going to do a lot of movements and they were really behind the eight ball. Um, what, what are some other uh, examples or advice that you uh, could tease out? The, the, uh, the best investors typically go against the grain. So mm. doing what everybody else does is not the way to be a great investor. So mm. typically the greatest investors have not followed conventional wisdom. They've gone against the grain or with conventional wisdom. And I think that's an important factor people should take into account. But generally make certain when you're getting an investment process, you're getting a fund, make sure you know what the fees are. Yeah. Make sure you know um, how to get information about the, how the performance is doing. Make sure the organization is a stable one. Make sure the people in the organization are putting a lot of their own money alongside you. Make sure you know who the other investors are because smart money knows how to find good deals. If you've never heard of anybody else investing alongside you, that's not a great sign. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Private equity funds seem to be just having a heyday they seem to be larger than ever and controlling uh, just an incredible amount of money is uh, investing in those uh, uh, a good well, thing to be doing these days there, there are thousands of private equity funds and obviously some will, will outperform the market but the trick is to invest with somebody who has a long track record the people that produce the track record are still there the fees are reasonable the disclosure is very good and that there are other investors alongside you who are very sophisticated and also make certain you know what rate of return you're expecting so to th expect you're going to get 25% annualized rates of return is probably unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Realistic returns for private equity are probably mid-teen, mid-15% uh, net would probably be a reasonable expectation from a good oh. private equity fund. There may be some that do better, but you shouldn't expect 25% because you'll probably be disappointed. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you feel uh, the, the do do investors have to be able to read the markets like we're you know, we have a war going on. We have uh, a disruption in in uh, in, uh, you know, goods and services. Uh, how, how important is that to read or do you leave that up to the fund manager? Well, if you try to time the markets based on what the news is every day, you'll go crazy <laughs> because the markets are always going to do something crazy based and overreact to the to uh, current events. So mm -hmm. what you should do is to find a manager that's invested through good and bad times and let that manager make the decision about when to sell, when to buy, what price to pay. Because I think it's, a, it's difficult to really do that when you're sitting on the sidelines. It's a mistake to think that you're a genius in making widgets or a genius as an athlete. You're going to be a genius as well in, in investing. They're two mm -hmm. different sets of skills, and you just can't think that somebody's going to be great at, as a manufacturer and become great as an investor. That just doesn't happen regularly. So you probably shouldn't email your uh, fund manager every day saying, did we go up today? Did we go up today? I would say probably getting a good <laughs> fund manager you can trust, who's honest, who's also in, uh, available to you to tell you what's going on, is probably a good thing to do. I've heard some people say uh, that you should kind of set it, forget it, make good investments, and then let them ride and let them build over time. Uh, time well, that's is what Warren Buffett has done. Remember, Warren mm -hmm. Buffett averaged 20% uh, a year for 60 years in a row. 
Yeah. Now, how do you do that? Well, he doesn't sell a lot because when you sell, you pay taxes if it's profitable. And also you have transaction costs. So to, mm-hmm. to avoid transaction costs and also to avoid taxes, if you don't sell, you're better off in most cases. Yeah, because taxes will uh, dilute your investment capital, right? That you can Absolutely. reinvest in something else. Um, and it, over time, I mean, technically, I think the long order of things or the assumption is, is that, you know, the stock market will go up, values will go up, real estate will go up. And we've certainly seen that over the time. Well, look, over the uh, last hundred years or so, the, the Dow Jones and the S&P 500 largely have gone up by around 6% a year. So while well, it's not staggering and particularly when you have higher inflation, but let's suppose it's 8% a year because of inflation. Um, that's not terrible. And so if you're trying to get much higher rates of return, you really need to know what you're doing and go into really good private equity funds, which may be difficult to get into for the average investor. Mm-hmm. What are some other time-tested principles you outlined in the book that you can tease out? Well, I think it's very important to actually do a lot of reading about what you're, what you're investing in. Uh-huh. You can't know too much. And I think uh, it's also important to make sure you understand the fees because the fees can be very difficult to understand sometimes. Mm-hmm. Now, if you say, I don't want to have a manager, I'm going to do it myself, that's possible, but you really need to know what you're doing and put a lot of time into it and really invest with somebody that knows as a partner who's doing some, who has experience doing what you want them to do. And so I think it's very difficult to beat the market on a consistent basis if you're not a professional and even professionals have a hard time doing it. There you go. There you go. Should you find a fund or if you're going to invest yourself, should you, uh, what kind of balancing should you do? What should you put some in gold and secure funds? And then um, look, it depends on how old you are and what you need the money for and what the yield is. Let's suppose you're older and you're living on a fixed income. You want a certain amount of current yield, then probably going into fixed income instruments like bonds probably helps more. If -hmm. you really don't care about that, you just care about capital appreciation then probably stocks are makes more sense because they may not provide dividends, but they will probably go up over a period of time. Gold is a, is a bet on, on basically inflation. When inflation mm-hmm. is high, gold should go up. And when inflation is low, gold should go down. I think the, the run up on gold prices is probably past us now. And I think it's probably too late to go into gold and really make a lot of money now. Is it true that one of the things you have to realize about the stock market is whatever they're pricing in today sometimes is months or years down the road, whether it's bet on, uh, you know, earnings for a company or things like that. And so you have to realize that's already priced in sometimes what you're betting on. Yes. I mean, they are, they trade on typically on price to earnings ratios, PE ratios, but those are often for uh, well into the future. And so like Mm -hmm. it it really means let's suppose you have a P.E. ratio of 15, P.E. 15. That means that at uh, that that, you know, you're betting that you're going to get your money back in 15 years, more or less, at the Mm -hmm. current earnings that the company has. And that's now that's a long uh, way away. Um, You know, sometimes companies has a company was recently sold for 50 times revenues. Our our young venture capitalist or uh, entrepreneur built the company. It was sold to Adobe at 50 times revenues. Well, that's a big, mm-hmm. you know, it's a big uh, price. Sometimes those things can be justified. Maybe that one is, but generally make sure you know what you're doing. And as a general rule of thumb, buying things with, with PE pre- ratios in the single digit range makes a lot more sense than, than, than buying something with a 50 times PE ratio. Yeah. So it, it has a chance to go up. Uh, I remember the dot-com era was crazy. I was investing in that uh, when the dot-com era came out. Uh, it, was, it was crazy to make a lot of money, very exuberant market. Of course, I saw the top of it and it crashed. Um, do, I, do you talk about the book you mentioned, alluded earlier, but depending upon your age? I remember being trained as a stockbroker. One thing that they talked about was, you know, when you're younger, you can do high, more high risk investments. When you're older, you want to do something that's more safety and secure. Well, when you're older, you, you may not be working anymore. You're not earning current income mm-hmm. and you're living off of retirement. So you got to be ri- uh, more risk adverse. When you're younger, you feel like you're never going to die. Nothing can go wrong. <laughs> and basically, you're smarter than everybody else. And so, you know, you'll make mistakes, you'll learn. It may not be uh, a great investment returns, but at least you'll feel, well, I'll go out and make more money later because I can do so. But I think it depends on your age and what your net worth is and how much money you need to live on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think is the the real uh, future of, of, if you were to say a segment of stocks or valuations or companies would be really hot in the future, maybe a year or two out, uh, what, what would you put that in? Maybe tech well, for I, uh, I, AI or anything? 
well, AI companies will very do very well. Of course, there are so many different types of AI. You have to understand what they do. Uh, things relating to biotech, CRISPR uh, would be pretty, pretty good as well. In the, well into the future, things relating to quantum computing will probably do pretty well. Uh, Space-related companies, things that deal with the exploration of space, things that deal with healthy food uh, will probably do quite well also, because there's a big interest in that now. Um, and so those are some things that are trends of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, you, so you co-founded your company. How many years ago was it? I started it 35 years ago. 35 years ago. Any advice you have to entrepreneurs or people who are looking to start yes. their own companies? Uh, don't listen to people telling you it can't get done. People told me it wouldn't get off the ground. Um, wow. Make sure you're passionate about it. Make sure you really want to work hard and make, build it. Don't be afraid of mistakes. And, you know, and also surround yourself with people that are smarter than you and are willing to work hard as well. And remember, build, to building a great company takes years. It doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs, they struggled for many, many years before they actually got it off the ground and they became successful. It takes a long time to actually make it work. But if you're really dedicated, you can, in this country, build a great company. It's one of the great things about this country, isn't it? Right. We do believe in the American dream, as it's so-called, and, and entrepreneurs in this country do quite well. There you go. If you could go back, would you do it differently? Would you maybe, I don't know, become a fishing instructor or well, something? I, I, I wish I had started earlier. I started when I was 37. I wish I had started at 27. Ah. And uh, I also wish that I had avoided some of the mistakes I made. But, you know, in the end, I'm, I'm reasonably happy with where I wound up. There you go. I mean, life has an interesting twist. I remember saying to my business partner when we were 22 and we started our first multimillionaire company, I said to him, you know, we should do this now because we're 22 because I don't think I'm going to have the energy of this when I'm 50 to start a company. <laughs> well, it's true. 22, you're willing to, to try lots of things and if you oh, yeah. fail, it's not the end of the earth, right? Yeah, you can live on top ramen and, and uh, sweat equity your way to success, which is what we did. Uh, so this is an amazing book and it's great that you're sharing all this data. So that people can learn more and and do more. Uh, who, who? What were some leaders that inspired you, or maybe authors of leadership books that inspired you or motivated you as you're building your company? Well, I, I when I was a young man, John Kennedy was running for president, and I was mm -hmm. inspired by his commitment to public service. There's no doubt that he was inspirational uh, to me. And as you read back on people great in American history, you know Abraham Lincoln held the country together. There's no doubt. Thought he's a spectacular uh, leader. Teddy Roosevelt did a great job in reviving and revitalizing the presidency. There's no doubt uh, he's unique and, and a great leader as well. In the business world, I think uh, I've been inspired what Bill Gates was able to do from, uh, you know, as a young person, what Steve Jobs was able to do as a young person. And of course, Jeff Bezos done a spectacular job in building Amazon. Mm -hmm. And as, as one of the, I imagine one of the things that you enjoy uh, having the level of success you did is giving a chance to give back. Uh, you were the original signer of the Giving Pledge, recipient of a Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and how important that is to you. Um, I came from very modest circumstances. My parents were not college or high school educated. And so I got lucky in life and made a fair amount of money by normal human standards, not by uh, the standards of, let's say, someone like uh, Elon Musk, who's you know the richest man in the world, but by normal standards, a lot of money. And I decided to be an original signer of the Giving Pledge and basically give away all my money over a period of time. Mm -hmm. So I'm very actively involved in, in education, medical research, and also what I've called patriotic philanthropy, fixing up the Washington Monument or Lincoln Memorial or Jefferson Memorial or buying the Magna Carta to remind people of our history and heritage and hopefully educating them about the good and bad things we've done in the past. Mm. Do you have Warren Buffett on speed dial and text message? Uh, I know Warren, but uh, I don't think... Uh, you know, I, I would call him every five minutes and have him on speed dial. Darn it. I was going to ask you if he used emojis. Well, when I did he dedicate the book to him. Oh, there you go. I was going to ask you if he used emojis when uh, he texts. Uh, so. I'm not sure I know how to do that, but uh, I'm going to learn how to use them. There you go. We had we had someone who was uh, texting with, uh, oh, who's the big health guy who uh, navigated us through the to the coronavirus, uh, for someone from Good Morning America, and we found out that he, he does use emojis. So I'm always curious how many people do that so uh what's the most prized possession uh, on the in the booth behind you the boxes behind you the the uh, well, uh, the behind shelves. me is a uh rare copy of the declaration of independence this is a facsimile of i own about 10 rare copies and put wow. them on display around the uh, country this is a facsimile of it a very rare copy of it um and then behind me i have uh, some championship basketball game uh, balls from duke university i was chairman of the board at duke and went to college there ah. they won a few NCA basketball championships. And so 
that's uh, something that's behind me that I, I uh, value as well. There you go. I love the importance of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, what this country was founded on. You know, I learned how important it is that that's, that's an inspiration to the ideal of the human spirit, the uh, human mind. And entrepreneurism, I think, is what made us a great country, wouldn't you say? I agree. Entrepreneurs uh, really built this country because people that started these companies and built in the big companies really helped fuel the economic growth of this country. The Declaration of Independence has the most famous sentence in the English language. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's what this country is about, though we obviously have not lived up to that principle as much as we should, but we're making progress. There you go. There you go. Anything more you want to tease out on the book before we go? I would just say that people should be realistic about their expectations uh, of investing. And if they do make a fair amount of money or any money investment, try to give something back to the country. The country is an incredible country, the greatest in the world, but it only is going to be great in the future if everybody gives something back in their time, their energy, and maybe even money. That's something, some cause that can make this country slightly better than it is. There you go. There you go. This, this, we are all stewards to this uh, young uh, 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 democracy. And uh, we've all got to make sure it gets the next generation <laughs> and those following. Uh, so give us your dot coms, uh, David, uh, where you want people to look you up on the internet, uh, please. Well, uh, david.rubenstein at carlisle.com is, uh, is a way that people can reach me. There you go. Thank you very much, David, for Thank spending you. some My time pleasure. with us on the show. My, uh, my pleasure as well. Uh, be sure to check it on YouTube so you can see the wonderful right. array of Thank shelves and, and data he has. Uh, order up the book wherever fine books are sold. Stay out of those alleyway bookstores. Uh, go uh, order the book How to Invest, Masters on the Craft, out September 13, 2022 by David M. Rubenstein. Uh, thank you very much for, for being on the show. Thanks for tuning Thank in. You. We'll see you guys next Thank time. You. My pleasure.